Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the next level of the Seditionist. We're trying something a little bit new here. You're going to see both of us at the same time, which is kind of funky, kind of cool, and uh, hopefully it won't go crashing and burning on us after we get into this very heated debate of uh, homework. We know that homework right now is really flooding the newspapers, and um, Keith and I, for once, I think we may even have some conflicting ideas about this, uh, but at the end, I'm sure we'll, we'll both end up agreeing, <laughs> because at, at the core of everything is, is, is our similar belief. Um, so I'm going to get started by posing the question, and then we'll sort of go from there. Keith, uh, what I'm reading is that a lot of uh, parents out there are trying to, to persuade parents and or persuade teachers to do no homework, uh, have a zero homework policy, let's say for the primary kids, elementary, K to four. Uh, and they're saying that there's research out there that says it shows no academic benefit. So what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, yes. I mean, we've seen some anecdotal, it's not anecdotal at this point, I can't say that. We have hard evidence that does show us that there is no academic gain for young children when it comes to homework, that they do not do better. Now, you know me, I'm constantly skeptical of any research that does any benchmarking as relates to standardized test data. But that having been said, we've had a preponderance of evidence for quite a long time that shows that homework is not the world's best thing. And certainly if we now have further evidence that shows that it shows we see no academic gains for kids, well, that comports with um, the research and evidence that we've been looking at for a long time that says that we can organize our learning structures better. Um, you know, it, it goes without saying, it's almost self-evident that some kids will need more practice than others. So I think it's one of the things we're going to have to talk about is the definition of homework. What is it that we're really talking about? But when it comes to independent practice at home and the fact that there is no correlated academic gain, well, that doesn't surprise me at all. And I think that it's very promising research that we ought to pay attention to. I agree. And right now, as an elementary principal, I'm really fighting. I even called you over the weekend saying, help, I don't know what to do here because I, I want my school to be on – the edge of quality research and, and and i want us to be doing what's best for our students but there's other research out there and people's opinions out there that are sort of floating the other direction as well um i agree with you when it comes to saying there may not be any academic uh, advantage and and I, you know i'm not one to argue with with the scientists if they say that you know i'll believe it However, there's other skills involved that we have to take into account. I guess there's a theoretical reality and then there's the practical reality. Um, so here are some of my concerns about saying no homework. Okay. First of all, um, a lot of the people that I'm reading that are doing the no homework, especially in kindergarten, have all day kindergarten. I only get to see our kids for two and a half hours a day. So that's not a lot of time. And then you add in the disaster that is the Common Core that basically gives, requires my kindergarten students to learn what we were learning in first and second grade in kindergarten in two and a half hours a day. Now, with that being said, I, am, I will never argue with busy work colossal waste of time don't do that to your kids uh, i am completely against practicing to the nth degree where you feel like your head's going to fall off no i'm vehemently against that as well am i am i for kindergarten students having maybe 10 minutes of work at home i'm not opposed to that yet and, and i'm having a really hard time because i'm usually really good at just saying this is what i believe this is what i'm going for but I mean, I, i'm still having a very hard time saying especially in kindergarten I only have them for two and a half hours a day. They need more practice time. And then, well, go ahead. Let's start, go with that one. Okay, so there are a couple of things. Let's work through those. The first and I'm thing to say I'm in trying to fix my school plan, so. Yeah, absolutely. This is a good time for us to be doing this. So, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Patrick Moynihan had a quote that I tend to repeat fairly often, and I'm pleased to do so, um, and that's, people are entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. So we were talking a moment ago, ago about a prevailing opinion uh, that I hear often from teachers. Um, I was actually just talking about this today in professional development. People say, well, I think that homework is good for kids, and I think it's my responsibility to do blank, and I've been teaching for 30 years, and I have to... The science is clear, right? There's uh, two researchers that come to mind. There's Cooper at Duke, and there's Kralovich at Arizona, and here's a direct quote. 
The facts are clear. The research is very clear. There is no evidence that any amount of homework improves the academic performance of elementary students, period, end of quote. Right? So this idea of, um, you know, well, I think, I'm, I'm done with people who say, well, I think, in the face of evidence. These are the flat earthers to me. You know, well, I look up in the sky and what I see is, okay, I don't want you to listen, Copernicus, I don't have time for that, you know. We're dealing with children's lives here. Um, so facts versus opinion, I take the facts every time. I'm not suggesting that we don't be skeptical about research, but there does come a point where research is clear. Germ theory is not up for debate, you know. It's just the way it is. So I hear people talk about that, so I drill down more. I have this debate with my friend Marty Axiotis a lot, and she'll say, well, I think it's my responsibility. I'll say, why do um, you kids work late, for example, something that we talk about a little and that we fight about a lot. Well, I feel that we have to teach kids that. I'm not suggesting that we educators don't have embedded literacy skill sets for the real world within the course of our instruction. The teaching things like responsibility and promptness and respect, those aren't curricular standards, right? Those may be sociological phenomenon, but that's not what we're trying to teach. The topic at hand is homework, and the evidence shows that homework does not have students improve at the elementary level, specifically, um, that's what was studied in this particular case. So, are there some kids that need certain amounts of practice? Yes, of course there are. Are there some kids who need more practice than others? Sure. But I think that you hit on a key, that we do need to differentiate between forms of practice that we as master practitioners prescribe to pick up deficits, and the traditional concept of homework, which I think carries a, a, a political factor to it as well as a pedagogical one and 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 i think right now at least in my and this is sort of an interesting seditionist video for us because i am I'm, I'm conflicted within myself and i'm trying to do what's right for my school at the same time so yeah. this is not a, 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 a i have the facts in my brain type of feeling right now i'm very mixed um so so and I, this is not a vice yeah and then i hear what you're saying and i agree with what you're saying um and again, to bring in the idea of you know, a, a student-centered decision making, you know, there may be a child that needs practice. I, I don't like the word homework either, but practice, right. uh, more practice, a different type of practice. Um, what bothers me about homework and what I'm trying to change in my building is the idea of giving 20 questions for everybody and blanket it out there because it's homework. There you go. I may not need that, and the kid beside me may need more or less. Or So it has to be a prescribed practice based on individual needs for the student. To say, wipe it out completely, I still have a problem with it. And, 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 and the reason I think I have a problem with it, at least at the moment, is because of some of the things that I've been reading in terms of mainly from parents, and, and the reason they feel like it's it's not worthy, and, and some of the reasons that I'm getting is th they're too busy at home. It's too difficult to get their kids to do it. Uh, the kids, after they get home, for, have dinner and come go to their sports practice, they don't have time for homework. To me, everything I was reading came apart as their world is parent-centered and not student-centered. They, as the parent, don't want to parent their child and say, look, this is part of your world. When you get home, whatever home, whatever practice you have to do, do it now. Hopefully it won't be a lot. But it, it almost came across, a lot of the opinions, was that the parents didn't want to be bothered with trying to force their child to do this work. If, if the work's legitimate or not, that to me is not a good reason to not have practice at home because the parents, because it's too difficult for the parents to get their kids to do it and things like that. What are your thoughts? I don't think that it's ever a good idea to force a child to do anything. I'm an anti-coercion oriented person. If we accept as a maxim that students will not learn what is not relevant to them, and if we believe the student's choice is rooted in that, that which I think that we must, based on not only research, but our pedagogical experiences as professional educators. I don't think it makes sense for people to force kids to do things. There's a difference between a child electing to practice a skill that he has realized is relevant or that she believes that they need to do. Um, there's a difference between the teacher creating conditions for success and for practice, but that's a very different thing than a prescribed mechanism, you will do this thing. That's a productivity mindset that I find largely to be an artifact of 19th century industrial 
thinking. You hit on a nail on the head when you said that not every kid will need to do everything. Right? Well, the very definition of homework is you will go home and you will do this thing. I think that a, a, a radical pedagogue's approach, a revolutionized pedagogue's approach would say that it's appropriate for the parents to say, I don't want to force my kids to do this, and they are right, they probably don't have enough time. If we look at even a basic flipped classroom model, and we shift the experience of you're going to go do the you know uh, prepared materials at home, you're going to watch the video, or you're going to explore this thing, so long as that's in the context of relevance to the child, I think that's fine. It's not necessarily illicit to say, hey, I want you guys to spend some time looking at this. But the teacher has to take a great deal of responsibility in crafting that situation so that it is relevant to the individual child and it is individualized, not homogenized. All of this comes out of something that we're skirting around the outside of and I think is worth addressing, but this really comes down to assessment. The homework is like the carbuncle stuck to the side of assessment. I, I hear a lot of people protest the elimination of homework because it eliminates so much of their assessment. Well, that's because it's fallacious assessment. You don't grade the preseason games in football for a reason. You and I are Steelers fans. Nobody is going to throw Antonio Brown off the field if he drops six in a row in practice and makes the touchdown of the game. The only thing that matters is the touchdown of the game. Failure in practice is expected, right? And, you know, people can go back and watch our good kids to be a professional athlete, you know, uh, to get more on that. But uh, I think that we have to revisit our concept of assessment, which is not based in authentic skills application. If you're going to redesign learning to be authentic and relevant for kids, you have to redesign assessment to be relevant and authentic. And there's nothing authentic about practicing in a vacuum. Most homework is practicing in a vacuum. So we'd much rather see us create conditions of authenticity. And, and that's a big thing that I'm fighting right now is like the old archaic, hear your spelling words on Monday, I want you to write them five times each. Pointless. I mean, how silly. And, and so what I think I hear, your, what I think I hear you saying and, and is that we shouldn't force the need for homework at, at home, like the parents shouldn't have to force their child. But with that being said, homework we're using that term still because we don't have a better one yet, we'll call it practice, mm -hmm. um, should be so relevant to the child that the child wants to do it. And, and if that's the case, my, my rebuttal to that would be, I'm not sure a kindergartner or fourth or first grader or even a second grader would know at that point yet that you sort of need to know your math facts. I mean, let's, let, let's, let's just pick a, pick an example, math fact practice. Um, you know, I don't like giving 20 problems. Like I don't like when my teachers do that. Like, here's, here's a worksheet of 20 problems. Go and do them. That, to me, seems archaic. To say the least. Yes. But I do acknowledge the fact that kids need to practice their individual math facts, and it's something that's going to help them from years and years to come, at least through high school, whenever they've got all the harder maths and if they go into science. And so coupled with that is... The rebuttal that I hear a lot is, you know, the parent, the parents will take care of that at home. They'll work on the facts. You don't have to give them the homework to do it. The parents will do that. Um, the, there's the one uh, news article right now where the where the teacher said your homework is to uh, have dinner with your family, go play with your family, play with your friends, all that kind of stuff. And all of that is great if you've got a great set of parents that are willing. Ah, to you're them. right. There you go. Because the other thing that I just recently read was. Okay, parents don't have time for this homework stuff and the kids. However, they, they're spending over 25 hours a week on video games and television and social media and all this kind of stuff. So wh where, where do we start to prioritize that time frame? Okay, because I'm still not convinced that, that there's absolutely no need for practice. I totally am convinced that we need to revamp what we call homework because I think our homework is still very outdated, but the need to practice, especially some of those basic skills that really the only way you can get it is repetition. Um, we could do it in a more entertaining way, in a more individualized way. You may need it more than I do, that type of thing. But I'm, I'm still not convinced that we need no homework and that that's going to help all kids because I've got children in my building that I know if I say no homework they're not going to talk to their parents they're not going to do anything until they get back into my building the next day and I don't think that's healthy either thoughts 
the need for practice is different from being forced to practice is different from doing homework you know if i manned i eliminated practice cards as a music teacher rob and i are both music teachers in our background for those of you who are watching i gave up on them because it's bull crap the kids are going to fill out whatever they want to fill out it doesn't matter they're just going to put a number down i it's my responsibility and this goes to my next point to create conditions of relevance so that the kid wants to practice and that's my job i'm a professional educator it's my responsibility to create conditions of relevance that connect to those individual kids that speak to their interests to where they are to what they're doing to what matters to them to get them to invest in learning the skill if i haven't done that they ought not to be coerced or forced into practicing because i didn't do my job right and this is a huge departure from the 19th century model it's a huge departure from the old teacher and i know that's so well you're going to have to prove it and if people think that that's a form of privilege that i pity their perspective on children kids only ever do what kids want to do they can be forced to comply but compliance is in the learning so if let's use a couple of the examples you gave if kids are spending their time with video games and social media which we know they are it's my responsibility as a pedagogue and a curriculum designer to, to use that framework to find the authentic problem with which to teach. There's a reason that I started playing Pokemon Go. My elementary school kids here in the 22207 are playing this game. If I can get my math teachers not to teach 12x minus 4 over and instead talk about how many candies do I need to evolve three Pidgeys to a Pidgeotto if I start with 58 Pidgeys, that's relevant out of the gate to a huge number of my kids. Now, the skills being practiced are going to be the same skills. They're going to be doing the things that we want them to do, doing calculations, enhancing their concept of numeracy, applying it in their real life, but they're doing it because they want to. And the carrot that brought them there is me going into their authentic context. We can say child-centered all we want, but if our attitude is, I want the child to comply with my directive, that's still a teacher-centered or a scolio-centric attitude. I want to add one other thing. I really appreciate the distinction that you made. Giving homework assignments that are fluffy can be just as damaging and are more damaging than none at all. You tell a kid, go have dinner with your family who doesn't have a family. You go tell kids, go play in the yard when they live in inner city Baltimore. Come on. Come on. That stuff has no place. That's nonsense. Let's not substitute fluffy nonsense for a structure that is itself problematic. So I think this comes down to, again, we have to design relevant curricular instruction and then use assessment practices that foster and foment the application of those authentic skills or we're just wasting our time. Amen, brother. And I think here's, here's this is going to be my final thought, I think, on this is, and it, it all boils down to this, and it's pretty much everything we've always said. You know, every student needs something different. And, and as a true educator, if that child needs more practice, then, then they should be getting it. If the other child doesn't need more practice, then, then you're just wasting their time. It should be authentic practice. It should be practice that is relevant to them in their world. Yeah. And, 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 but, but, but I'm not saying no homework. I, I still can't get to the point of zero homework. I can get to the point of saying we need practice that is relevant, authentic, and personalized, individualized for each student, but I, but I can't say across the board yet, zero homework, because I still think they get some soft skills from that that is a benefit to them. Sorry about my phone, but we're just going to ignore that. The, uh, I still think they get some authentic skills for some of, or I'm sorry, some soft skills from that that's a good experience for them. Um, and I, I, I sort of believe in the Mr. Miyagi son from the Karate Kid. You know, one extreme or the other extreme, you end up getting yourself in trouble. If you go down, right down the middle, you won't get squished just like grape or whatever that saying was. You know, the extremes can be can be a bit much. Um, I think this year I'm going to uh, work with my teachers to significantly. Well, no, let's do away with the term homework let's let's go to let's go to maybe needing more practice on certain things lessen it make it far more authentic and far more reasonable um and let's see where that goes and maybe we can even hit this topic again in a couple months and i'll sort of let you know how okay. things are going here because there is a part of me that 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 wants to say no homework but i'm just not there yet um i want to do what's right for every child and i guess 
uh, knowing a few children in the back of my head that this idea of practicing some st skills at home is a good thing for them and their family. I have a hard time saying that blanket statement for no for all type of feeling. Why don't you wrap us up, buddy? Yeah, I agree with you on the point that saying no for all would probably be the wrong thing because some kids may need practice. I think I make a very strong distinction between practice that a child chooses to do and homework, which is prescribed uh, required compliance practice. There's a great anecdote that I heard recently from a phys ed friend of mine who says, when I tell my players on my soccer team that they have to go and hit the gym, they don't. They don't want to. But when I leave the gym open and I give them optional time outside of practice, they're all there, right? Just the nuance of choice is significant. We as humans are not hardwired to be compliant, regimented people. We're, we're, we're looking to create feral children. We want them running in the wild and doing what's best for them. Well, if we're going to run the full scope and wild of their imaginations, of their potential, of their creativity, of their authenticity, then they have to choose to do these things. And that's why I think that eliminating homework as a compulsory item frees us up to empower children with the choice they need and it will improve the quality of our assessments if they are authentic and low stakes because we'll see the deficits emerge more rapidly and more clearly and that will allow us to tailor our interventions. Certainly some kids will always need practice but the minute we tell them you must We've lessened our ability to impact them. I think that it's, a, as, as always, it's a systemic thing. You drill down through homework, you get to the core of non-coercion. Once we stop telling, telling kids, you must do this, it's good for you, we start to recognize that there are some powerful vehicles in creating conditions of choice for kids. I, 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 I got a good one out of that, especially, and, and I think I'm going to steal it. Um, the, the idea of compulsory versus... Well, would be the opposite, uh, freedom of choice. I think that's something I could really dig into here, and 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 I can work with my teachers on that. We don't need compulsory; we need options and choices and ideas. And 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 if we play it right, the the students will practice as they need because they will want to. And well, one of the kickers in that is making sure that the assessment risks are low and that the stakes are low so the kids who haven't gotten enough practice in a skill set will be able to see why my skill is really low here without being told you're failing, you have an F, you have a zero. Those judgment statements that go along with traditional assessment are psychosocially damaging and create conditions of shame which we know biologically is bad for kids. So we have to marry those two ideas. All right, brother. This was this was one of my favorite seditionists yet, I think. And um, you know, thank you everybody for listening. Please subscribe to us, and also if you have any comments, this like Keith's doing, just down below. Uh, we'd love to hear your say on this. Um, this is probably the closest thing to Keith and I ever not being 100% in line, and, and I love it because I learn from this man as much as you do. So um, it, it gives me things to think about, and um, as a principal, I, I have to practice what I preach. So I'll be taking what Keith and I were just talking about now and creating some, some new ideas with my teachers. I'm meeting with them tomorrow, so we'll be having this conversation. And uh, now, as any good debater should, I can feel both sides of the problem and let them come up with a with a solid answer for, for our collective uh, benefit benefit to our school and our and our students. Uh, this is Rob Furman and Keith Reeves signing off from the Seditionists. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.